Welcome to Four Eyes Furniture, I'm Chris, and today we're gonna almost drop a slab, make it snow, and hopefully build a nice table. Let's get to it. Anytime you go to the lumber yard, you see all the usuals. Walnut, oak, maple, but this species I had never seen. This is from Southeast Asia originally, a chocolate alternative, any guesses? Vanilla. It wasn't vanilla. As it turns out, the correct answer was carob. So seeing as how I had no idea that carob wood was even a thing, you can probably tell that I have no idea how this thing is going to turn out. And this isn't the only unknown with this project, as you're going to see. So to start things off, I made myself a template out of some sheets of old paper. That way I could use that to kind of trace out roughly what I was thinking for the shape of the top. And the whole purpose of doing this is so that I can use my track saw to cut some flat edges on the slab in order to build a somewhat tight-fitting form. And everything is still going to be way oversized at this point, but it'll just make it easier to move forward. Now, the reason that I have a carob slab in the first place is a couple weeks ago, I took a big piece of walnut to get flattened at Street Tree Revival. And while I was there talking to John, that's the big guy you saw a minute ago, I was saying that I wanted to try something different. So while he was showing me around, these pieces caught my eye. And I figured, why not kill two birds with one stone? So we threw it up on the woodwiz, flattened it, and... Now you're fully up to speed. Now, as long as this isn't your first time watching one of my videos, then you know that I include a lot of drawings and animations to help explain what's going on. And in the last video, I had asked a question about whether you think these drawings are helpful or disruptive to the flow. And a ton of you commented, and it was overwhelmingly in support of keeping the drawings in, which made me really happy because making the drawings is one of my favorite parts about making these videos. Well, I wanted to try something new, and I was pretty nervous about this because I was worried that it might come off as self-important or something like that. But anyway, what I wanted to do was try to sell the drawing for the piece that we're building in this video as a one-of-one -one signed piece of artwork to raise money for charity. And here's how that played out. I made a post and explained the situation, the charity, and all that, and put together a quick website for a silent auction. I gave people seven days to put in their bids, highest bidder wins. Now, I don't know what month you're watching this in, but I built this project in October, which is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And in the end, I was really happy to be able to donate this money to an awesome local organization. So the winning bidder was a fellow named Michael, and he enabled us to raise $360 for the Women's and Children's Crisis Shelter. So a big thank you to Michael and to everybody else who put in bids. And this is something that we'll definitely do again. All right, so here I'm putting a sealer coat on the slab before we pour epoxy. And I'm just going to come right out and say it, but I hate the way that this slab looks right now. It's just way too orange and rustic for my taste. And I guess this is the downside of going in blind on a project. But at this point, I couldn't really turn back. So throughout this entire part of the project, I was just kind of brainstorming, thinking about things that I could do to try to downplay the color. So we'll definitely be coming back to this. Now, if you want to succeed in woodworking, for lack of a better word, you have to be anal. And in no place is that more evident than building a good epoxy-type form. And at the risk of spoiling things, you're going to see that for the first time in my form-building career, I sprung a leak, despite building what I think was a pretty good form. So I guess the question I should ask myself is, is there a flaw in my technique, and will I change anything? And my answer is, no, and probably not. And that's because this workflow has been really easy and pretty foolproof, which I can vouch for because I'm definitely a fool. But the quick and dirty tutorial would be cover melamine and tuck tape, attach the sides with screws and a silicone barrier, and as long as you're somewhat thorough, you shouldn't have any issues. And 90% of the melamine should still be usable for at least a few projects. Now that's not to say that you should try to rush it or slap things together. You can see in these shots that I take extra steps like roughly centering my screws across the thickness of my side pieces and cutting some extra angles on the pieces if there's a weird junction to help get better overlap, which is honestly probably overkill, but what can I say? It's the woodworker in me. I've got that better safe than sorry mentality, which is honestly a good thing because unless you've worked with it, you might not realize how viscous or unviscous, whichever one means thin, you might not realize how that skiss epoxy is. For example, the Thickset Fathom, the epoxy that I'm using here from Total Boat, most people would probably think that it's a Mrs. Buttersworth consistency, 
but in reality, it's much more like water, which is a good thing for slab tables. And actually, that brings up a comment that I've gotten a handful of times over the course of the last couple videos where people have either said that I should or asked why I don't use a vacuum pot to remove air from the epoxy before I pour it to avoid getting bubbles. So here is why I don't. First, I'm lazy and that would be an extra step. But second and more importantly, I don't think that it would actually do any good. So like I just mentioned, the epoxy is very thin and it's designed to be able to pour up to two inches thick in a single pour. And the setup time is very long. And thanks to those two things, any bubbles that show up have plenty of time to rise to the surface and pop on their own. And speaking of the bubbles, where they're coming from when you pour really isn't the epoxy itself, but the slab. The slab's full of little cracks, nooks, crannies, and those are all full of air. So I think to actually make a vacuum do anything, you would need to have the entire form with the slab and liquid epoxy in a vacuum. So you'd need a big pot. Now, I'm no epoxy scientist, so I could be totally wrong about all of this, but one thing that I'm definitely right about was my first point, which was, I'm lazy. So, all of that slow motion bubble popping, I hate to admit it, but it's all just for show. It just looks good in video, but it's pretty unnecessary. And I almost forgot my leak. So, despite being super meticulous building my form, where I went wrong was using leftover pieces of melamine that had some brad nail holes in them. And there was one spot where the hole and the tape didn't overlap. And there you go. First leak. Thankfully, nothing that a quick little dollop of flex paste couldn't handle. Also, for those of you who watched the last video, you'll remember that I introduced my extra epoxy project that I've had cooking for a few months. And a fly offed himself in there. Will it happen again? Two flies this time. Pro tip time. You might be wondering why I covered an entire 4x8 sheet of melamine and tape if I was only pouring epoxy in a slab that took up a fraction of the sheet. And the main reason is, my goal is to be able to use the same sheet for several consecutive projects. And if I cut it, then obviously I can only use the chunk on a project that's small enough to fit on it. But another reason is, whenever you're trying to remove a slab, usually the sides come off pretty easily, but it's hard to remove the base. You'll see people using crowbars and wedges, that kind of stuff. And I've been guilty of this in the past too. But if you have a large overhang, like this, you can just kind of pop release it. Which is really easy and satisfying. And if all goes well, you should have a sheet that you can keep using. Okay, pro tip two. And I'm saying this one out loud to remind myself to be better about it, but especially if you're working with epoxy, protect your lungs. I've actually heard people say that if you have a beard, then a respirator doesn't actually work. I think it's probably still better than nothing, but I don't know. Maybe it's time to go clean shaven. And maybe I'm holding a mini chainsaw too. And wearing a dress made of living snakes. In any case, I like to imagine that my lungs are kind of like the inside of a track saw, and I want my lungs to look more like the after than the before in this shot. That said, if anybody has a good recommendation that'll keep me in a beard and out of a snake dress, let me know. And speaking of clean shaven, next I headed back to Street Tree with the slab to shave off a few more fractions of an inch and get rid of all of the epoxy on the top of the slab. And I want to say that at this point, it would be just like a 64th of an inch over an inch and a half. So trigger warning to all of my metric fans out there, but that would be one and 33 64ths of an inch, or 38.496875 millimeters. I didn't convert that in my head. And actually that kind of sums up my feelings on the whole imperial versus metric argument. So let me start by saying, if I were king and you made me pick one system for the entire world to use, I'd go with metric. But I think where a lot of people make a moot point, at least having to do with woodworking, is that they always talk about how the math is so much easier in metric versus imperial, which sometimes is true and sometimes isn't true. But to me, why I don't think that's important is because what actually matters is your ability to dial a tool into a very specific measurement. So if you compare trying to set 1 in 33 64ths of an inch versus 38.496875 millimeters, 
they're equally hard. Which is why if you're in a situation where you need to measure something that specifically, you really shouldn't be measuring at all. There's actually a lot of techniques that we've covered in our tips series that dive into this concept. So I'll link a playlist in the description if you're interested in that. And end of the day, no matter what system you use, let's all just be friends and go grab a pint. Or a 20 ouncer as I like to call it. Okay, so here you can see that I've turned myself into a chicken. But while cleaning myself off and touching up the small cracks left in the slab, I had a lot of time to think about the color of the slab. So while I was at Street Treat, John had showed me this old carob box that they had sitting around. And if you compare the bottom, which has never seen sunlight, to the sides, which have, you can see that carob will actually tan quite a bit. So that's something to consider. But I still wasn't really loving it, and I decided that I'd experiment a little. So I went on Rockler's website and ordered some Rubio Monaco in pure, which is the natural color, and another can of charcoal, which is their darkest color. That way I could test them out on an offcut and get a better idea of what I actually liked. And I know at this point the charcoal just kind of looks like I painted the wood, but after going through the whole process, this is what it looks like. So looking at the pure section, I actually like the warm golden parts, but what I don't like is the contrast between that and the darker part. But on the side where I used charcoal, I think it looks a lot more subdued and even. And actually that brings up an interesting topic. Having spent 10 years woodworking now, something I've noticed is that most woodworkers are pretty adverse to staining when you're using nicer woods, but most normal people really don't care. Take my ex-girlfriend here, Dolores. By the way, she's my current wife, I just think it's funny to introduce her that way. And it's technically true. But anyway, she doesn't care about carob, she just wants whatever looks nicest to her. All that said, I'm still very much on the fence about what to do here, and I guess really what I'm debating is, do I do what makes me happy, or do I do what I think will probably make the most woodworkers happy? Okay, in every episode, I try to include one, what I'm calling, blatantly obvious woodworking tip. Last episode, I went over the best way to cut out a large rectangle, and in this video, I'm going to talk about the number one way that people screw up while sanding. So, here it is. I'd say about 80% of people think that you should sand like this, but really, you should sand like this. Okay, the one finger thing might be a bit of an exaggeration, but basically light pressure and let the sander do the work. And I like to take lengthwise passes to cover the entire piece and then widthwise passes. And the irony is that moving slow and methodically like this doesn't take any more time and you end up with a better result. Actually, there's a saying that I think originates from the military, and that is, slow is smooth, and smooth is fast. So therefore, by the transitive properties of sanding, slow is fast. And honestly, this is a concept that's true in so much of woodworking. Personally speaking, I can tell you that the bulk of the time that I mess up, it's because I either rushed or tried to cut a step short, and it ends up costing me more time in the end. Like here. I could have tried to route this entire round over in one super heavy pass instead of five passes, and I would have saved five or ten minutes. But I'd be way more likely to have tear out, which will take way more than five minutes to fix. And I know that's not as sexy as a lot of the tips that people like to share, but it's honestly way more useful than a lot of the bull tips that you'll find if you search here. So just remember, go slow, take it easy, you'll be fine. Thank you Simply Safe for sponsoring this video. I've had Simply Safe for over three years now, and I'm sure you've heard of them, but just in case, they make home security systems that are easy to set up, intuitive to use, get delivered right to your door, and that make sure your home is protected 24 seven by Simply Safe professional agents who are ready to dispatch authorities if it's ever needed. So I started off with just the basics, window and door sensors, glass break sensors, and interior cameras. And I've since added their video doorbell, smart lock, and outdoor wireless cameras, which is awesome. It's super easy to install, has a 140 degree field of view, eight times zoom, a built-in spotlight with color night vision, and even two-way audio so you can communicate through it and keep an eye on things around the clock. If you've been thinking about getting a home security system, or even if you already have one and you think there could be something better out there, you owe it to yourself to check out Simply Safe. And right now is the perfect time to take advantage of their biggest sale of the year. 
There are no long-term contracts or hidden fees or any of that stuff. And there really is no safe like Simply Safe. So save up to 40% on your Simply Safe security system by visiting simplysafe.com slash four eyes. All right. Thanks, Simply Safe. All right. Let's turn our attention to the base. So as you know, we have a top that's wider at one end than the other. And I wanted to go for the sort of four-legged spider table design that I pretty naturally gravitate towards. But that meant that on this one, I needed the legs to be closer together at one end and further apart at the other. So I wasn't really sure exactly how I was going to go about this. And as you're going to see, the material that I ended up using made that decision for me. But regardless of that, the basic idea is that where the pieces cross over or intersect can't be in the middle, like on a normal symmetrical table. It needs to be biased towards the narrower end where the legs are closer. So the wood that I'm using here is another first for me, and it's called red iron bark eucalyptus. And these pieces are actually from salvaged trees right here in my hometown of Whittier. Now, since this was a first for me, I figured that a good place to start might be seeing what the wood actually looks like. So here I'm just cleaning up one of the pieces and then squirting some water on it, which will give me a pretty accurate idea of how it's going to turn out. And here you can see just how different a clean piece looks compared to the dirty boards we're starting with. Now, something you probably noticed is that I'm starting here with a bunch of relatively small chunks of wood compared to how I normally do it, where I start with much longer, wider boards. And that meant that I had to build the base in a different way. And I knew that I was going to need one really chunky piece in particular that's going to act as a sort of bridge connector piece. So I started off by gluing two pieces into one thick block, and we'll just set that aside to let it dry. So this base is going to be made out of three shapes. A leg shape, a stretcher shape, and the previously mentioned bridge connector shape. And they need to be really accurate, so I'm going to start things off by making myself a template for each of these shapes. So I'm only going to show the workflow for creating the bridge piece, because it's always the same. I draw it out. Then I use a combination of a bandsaw and sanders to get the piece shaped exactly how I want it. And a second ago, I said that this piece needed to be really accurate, and I guess that was kind of a lie, or I misspoke. So actually what it needs to be is repeatable. The only parts of the template that need to be accurate are wherever two of them meet, the faces that'll end up getting glued together. Everything else is just for looks. So whether an angle is 14.7 degrees instead of 15, or a radius is 15 30 seconds instead of a half an inch, it doesn't matter. Literally this, the part I'm pointing to here, is the only part that matters, functionally. Okay, so you know that I'm starting with a bunch of small pieces, and I guess that begs the question, why do I have a bunch of small pieces? And the reason is, what I'm using here are, for lack of a better word, rejects. And that doesn't mean bad pieces. It just means not good enough for a very specific purpose. So let me back up for a second to explain. So just like the slab, I got these from Street Tree Revival. And just from their name, you can probably guess what they do. But to fully explain, when a tree needs to be removed, whether that's because of a storm or disease or any other reason, they do what they can to salvage it. It's honestly a really great thing, and it's also a cool narrative that brands want to be a part of. And one of those brands is Taylor Guitars. And none of this is sponsored, by the way. But if anybody from Taylor's listening and wants to send me a guitar, I will gladly accept it. But anyway, a few weeks ago, they announced a new model that uses this wood, though it's slightly rebranded as Urban Iron Bark instead of Red Iron Bark Eucalyptus, because I guess it just sounds cooler. Anyway, to get back to these being rejected pieces... These are the pieces that fall just short of being guitar quality. So, by no means bad wood. Just not good enough. Kind of like FC Barcelona point guard, Rokas Yakubatis. Not NBA quality, but would beat the shit out of the best guy you went to high school with. Okay, so what I've been doing so far is cutting all of the flat edges on my base pieces. So, for example, I was using the Craig ACS track saw to cut these edges. And then I used my table saw with a quick sled setup to cut all the joint faces. And once we've gotten to this point, the next step is to glue up the legs and the stretchers into four sub-assemblies. And to do that, we'll just use a domino and some wood glue. And dowels or any other alternative would be totally fine here. Then by the next day, everything should be dry enough that I can use my templates to retrace the shapes onto my workpiece 
And then I'll use a bandsaw to cut off the bulk of the material, making sure that I stay on the outside edge of my marker line. And that's because to create the final shape, I'm going to tape my templates onto my workpiece and use a router with a templating bit. So basically, I'll work my way down as far as I can in a couple of passes. And then for my last pass, I'll switch over to using a flush trim bit. And I happen to be doing this on a router table, but this could be done handheld as well. Next, I'm going to have to do this exact same process for that bridge connector piece. But since it's all the same, we'll just kind of gloss over that. And then I'm going to use that same plywood sled again to cut my remaining crucial faces. So those would be the top of the legs where the tabletop will actually rest. Then the feet on the legs where the earth will rest. And then the faces on the bridge connector piece where nothing will rest. And as luck would have it, when I was making the piece, I exposed this huge knot hole, which I had to fill with epoxy, so that sent me back a few hours. But once everything was dry, I could cut in more dominoes and assemble everything. And this was the part of the base that I was the most unsure about going in. Basically, I wasn't sure how I was going to clamp everything together. And that's because normally when I make a base like this, I use a half lap joint, which is really easy to clamp together. But here I'm not, obviously. So I did a few dry runs and found that for the first two legs, I could use one clamping block and reference the center of the bridge connector's joint face, and that would give me good even pressure. For the second pair of legs though, I couldn't do that anymore. But what I found was that if I sandwiched the stretcher piece between two clamping blocks and then clamped another pair on the back of the legs at the same height, I could use two clamps to get even pressure again. And these clamping blocks are a lifesaver and I wish I could tell you where to get some, but unfortunately nobody makes them anymore, which is why we've even resorted to making some out of plywood. But if anybody does know where I can get these, let me know, cause I want more. Now a question that we get with pretty much every project at this point is, will there be plans for this one? And as is the case with a lot of the slab projects, for this one, no. And that's just because it's too specific to the top. That said, if you want to build something very similar to this, I'd recommend that spider table project course. It has a pretty similar look, and the construction methods are a little more universal and adaptable to more projects, so I think it's actually a better teaching tool. So for anybody interested in that, I'll throw a link in the description so you can go check it out. Next, I needed to figure out how I was going to attach the base and the top together. And at its simplest, I knew that I was going to need to use some kind of attachment plate. So I had this piece of six by six by quarter inch aluminum sitting around and I figured I could start by cutting that into four strips. So I'm kind of just flying by the seat of my pants here, trying to figure out what's going to work. I was pretty sure that I was going to want a screw hole at the center of my plate and to know where the center of the tops of my legs were. So I just started out by doing that and then assumed I'd figure it out from there once I got to that point. Now my initial idea was probably the most obvious one and that was that I would put the plates like this, but I mocked it up and things were just getting too close to the edge. So another idea was to rotate them 90 degrees, but then I realized that I wouldn't be able to access the screw holes because of the stretcher and the angle of the legs. So the solution for me ended up being the original orientation, but protruding towards the center of the table. So you know how a lot of times when you watch a video here on YouTube, the person will do their introduction and then they'll say something like, Hey, real quick, before we get started, if this is your first time here, smash that subscribe button and give this video a like to help the channel grow. They always say it's so matter of fact, and maybe they know something that I don't, but I've been YouTubing for like six years and I could not look a person in the eye and tell them with any confidence that that's true. So rather than asking you to hit the like button and the subscribe button, though if you want to, it is appreciated and I'm sure it doesn't hurt. What I'm going to do instead is just thank you for clicking on this video in the first place and more importantly, for sticking around to actually watch it. That is what makes a channel actually grow. It's the people watching it, not farming clicks. It's you genuinely showing an interest and sticking around to watch something. So thank you for doing that. Hey, sorry to interrupt real quick, um, but I was editing everything together and I was thinking about the fundraiser that we did earlier in the video, and I had a thought that Let's try to do something bigger. So here's the piece that I'm planning on building next. It's going to be a hall table. 
The base is going to be made out of white oak and the top is going to be made over a chunk of the leftover walnut slab that I used in the last video. So I'm going to throw a web page together. I'm going to have a link in the description and anybody's interested can go bid on that. All of the profits going to go to a charity and hopefully we can do something big. Okay, I'm going to go back to editing this one. Okay, so I've run out of time. I'm sanding the top through the grits and I can't put it off any longer. It's time to decide how I'm going to finish this slab. Do I go with the pure or do I go with the charcoal? And I'm going with the charcoal. So I know there's going to be some people that are going to say, why'd you ruin such a beautiful slab? And I get it. And those people aren't wrong for thinking that. But at the end of the day, unless somebody is paying me to make something to their specifications, I'm going to make it to my specifications. And I look at it this way. Worst case scenario, if I hate the way that this thing comes out, I'm only a couple of days work away from sanding off the finish and redoing it. But if I don't go for it, I'll always wonder if I would have liked it more. And I'll find myself in this same situation again at some point, so why not just find out now? So that takes us to the next question, which is what do I do about the base? So here is what that wood looks like finished. And I think it's actually really pretty. So it might surprise you to find out that I'm going to spray it black too. Now hear me out. There's actually a process called ammonia fuming that is somewhat common on this species of wood, so ebonizing it isn't unheard of. And like I said, it's not that I don't like the way that the wood looks. I do really like it and will definitely find other projects to use it and keep it looking natural. But liking things doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's all about pairs and combinations. I like the color, I just don't like it with the slab. It's like, I like guacamole, but I don't put it on my Cheerios. I know that some of you might not like what I did to this piece. And yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. And if the dude has taught us anything, it's that we shouldn't confuse opinion for fact. A fact is something that's proven to be true. And an opinion is a belief that you have that doesn't have to be based on fact. And we all know that famous saying about opinions and what they're like. Pie between onions. I guess technically it's this kind of pie, but... Thanks for watching.